Amen. Take your Bibles this morning, if you would. Stand and turn to uh, Ephesians 4. Turn and stand once you find it. Ephesians chapter 6. And uh, we'll start in verse 10, read down through verse 13. A few years ago, I preached a series of sermons on Wednesday nights dealing with each individual piece that's mentioned in um, this passage of Scripture. Um, the belt, the breastplate, the boots, the shield, the helmet, the sword, and all those. But this morning, we're going to do something a little different and take a broader look at the benefits, not so much at the pieces of equipment. And uh, we'll read it and uh, get into the message this morning. Let's go ahead and uh, again turn to Ephesians chapter 6, where we found that. And uh, start in verse 10, and uh, we'll read down to verse uh, 13. Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 10, and reading down to verse 13. And this is what it says. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the ruins of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Verse 13, our last verse says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand an evil day, and having done all, to stand. Let's pray. Father, again, we're grateful. Bless us now. And again, Lord, if someone here this morning is not saved, help them to realize that, Lord, uh, this is not going to be preached just from the perspective of someone that is saved and has the equipment, but, Lord, that how we can secure that equipment as well, how we can get that equipment. Of course, we can't have that, Lord, unless we uh, call on you for salvation, place our faith and trust in the blood that you have shed on the cross for us. Uh, Lord, we have a wage to pay as sinners, and the only way that we can gain entrance into heaven is by having someone other than ourselves, uh, someone other than someone on this earth, someone other than the works that we have done pay our sin wage for us. And there's only one person that can do that, Lord, and that is you. Uh, you came in the form of man, died on that cross, and shed your blood. And that blood is what pays that sin wage for mankind uh, to be able to go to heaven. And so we're thankful for what you did for us. And Lord, we pray that you help us now. And again, if there's someone here that's not saved, speak to their hearts, help them to realize what they need to do. And uh, just bless us. Help us as Christians as well uh, to gain uh, insight and to gain strength. Uh, Lord, into how we can better serve you uh, through this message this morning. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Now, this morning, again, what we're going to do is uh, do something a little bit different, I guess, than probably what is usually done with this passage of Scripture, and that is we're going to look at both saved and the lost. And I believe in verse 13, uh, a, a, the text kind of calls to both. Look at what it says. In verse 13, again, it says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. And so it's talking about also, uh, I believe you could say the unsaved, uh, to take the armor of God, to receive the armor of God. And that is, of course, Christ uh, coming to live in us and uh, uh, making us his temple. And uh, so what a blessing it is uh, when you get saved. Now, if you're lost, you may not know this, but Satan is fighting for your soul. And uh, not for the reason you may think. In other words, you know, a lot of people, many think of hell as the devil's playground. And I have to say, I was guilty of that for a long time, thinking that hell is like Satan's domain. But that's not the way it is at all. You know, they think of, uh, they think of hell as the devil's playground and, and that the free-spirited, wild, creative, party-going people go there and the devil is their leader. That's not it at all. Matter of fact, you're not reading your Bible if you think that's the way hell is. Uh, in, Matthew, in Matthew chapter 25, verse 41, it says, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. That's talking about hell right there and how it's prepared for the devil. And uh, when you start to look at the attributes of what hell is, uh, Revelation 20 verse 10 says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So that's the picture of hell. That's the biblical picture of hell. 
I've had people tell me, you know, you you always run into somebody if you go knock a door and talk to people about salvation and whatnot. You'll have some uh, some man. It's usually a man. Uh, that would come to the door and they'll go, well, oh, I guess I'm just going to go to hell then and I'll just go there and be with my buddies and we'll party and all that kind of stuff. But that's not the way hell is at all, uh, according to what Scripture is saying. And so, uh, and so um, what we want to deal with this morning is, is uh, dealing with Satan and dealing with uh, what he uh, uh, wants us to do and what he wants to, to do with us. And so if Satan is not the ruler of hell, and, and when he does get there, he's going to be tormented day and night forever and ever according to the scriptures, why does he have such a desire uh, for us to go there? Well, turn to 1 Kings. Turn back in your Old Testament. Keep there where you're at. We'll be back. Uh, if you've got one of those little Bible ribbons or if you've got a little piece of paper, stick there so we can come back to uh, Ephesians chapter 6. But turn to 1 Kings. In chapter 3, 1 Kings chapter 3, this is a pretty good lengthy uh, passage of scripture, uh, but it'll help us, because here's the best way that I know to explain why the devil has such a desire to cause people to go to hell. So in 1 Kings chapter 3, and uh, start in verse uh, 16, and, and uh, follow me along as I read, and it says, uh, then came there... Um, two women uh, that were harlots under the king that stood before him. And one woman said, Oh my Lord, I and this woman dwell in one house, and I was delivered of the child uh, with her in the house. Am I in the right one? Yes. And uh, it says, And it came to pass the third day after that I was delivered, that the woman was delivered also, and we were together. Uh, there was no stranger was with us in the house, save we and the two, uh, we two in the house. And the woman's child died in the night. Because she overlaid she arose at midnight and took my son from beside me, while thine handmaid slept and laid it in her bosom and laid her child in, uh, in my bosom. And when I rose in the morning uh, to give my child suck, behold, it was dead. But when I had considered it in the morning, behold, it was not my son which I did bear. And the other woman said, Nay, but the living is my son, uh, and the dead is thy son. And this said, uh, and this said, No, but the dead is. I'm way ahead of myself. Verse 22. And the other woman said, Nay, but the living is my son, and the dead is thy son. And this said, uh, and this said, No, but the dead is thy son, and the living uh, is uh, my son. Thus they spake before the king. Then said the king, The one saith, This is my son that liveth, and thy son is dead. And the other saith, Nay, but the son is, uh, is the dead, and my son is living. And the king said, Bring me a sword. And they brought a sword before the king. And the king said, Divide the living child in two. And give half to the one and half to the other. Then spake the woman whose the living child was the king unto the king, for her bowels yearned upon her. And she said, O oh my Lord, give her the living child, and in no wise slay it. But the other said, Let it be neither mine nor thine, but divide it. Then the king answered and said, Give her the living child, and in no wise slay it. She is the mother thereof. And all Israel heard of the judgment which the king had judged, and they feared the king, for they saw the wisdom of God was in him. Uh, to do judgment. And so, um, this is probably as close uh, to the spirit of the devil as you can get. You read that verse 26 again, and it says, Then spake the woman whose living child was, uh, was unto the king, for her bowels yearned upon her son. And she said, Oh, oh my Lord, give her the living child. Um, if you're saved, Satan sure doesn't want you to serve the Lord. He wants you to be miserable. And he sure doesn't want you to uh, cause someone else uh, getting saved, learning about uh, the armor of God. And what I'm getting at here is that's kind of a picture of how misery loves company. And I know what you're saying. How does that, what's that got to do with Satan? Well, when you think about that lady and then that child, and this, that's kind of the spirit of the devil right there. The lady whose child that wasn't, when they, when, when Solomon decided to divide that baby, and when he was doing it, he was playing a trick on him. Because he said, if I, if I tell them to divide, cut that baby in half and give each woman half of it, the woman's child whose that is, or the, the woman whose child that is, he knew what was going to happen. He knew what would happen is she'd say, no, don't divide it, give it to the other one. And what ended up happening is, of course, whose child it wasn't, 
She said, yeah, go ahead and divide it. You know, go ahead and cut it in half and give it to her. Because what she wanted is she didn't want that lady to have it. If she couldn't have it, she didn't want the other lady that whose child it was to have it either. Now, what I'm saying is that is the spirit of the devil. In other words, uh, when you say, well, why would the devil want us to go to hell if he's going to go there and be miserable too? Because that's the way the devil is. He doesn't want us to have uh, peace and tranquility and love and all that either. He wants to cause all of us uh, to go be miserable with him. Now, so I, I hope you kind of understand that. It makes sense to me. And it, so if you're saved, Satan sure doesn't want you to serve the Lord. He wants you to be miserable. And he wants you in the end to be miserable with him. And so he surely doesn't want uh, you to serve the Lord and learn anything from the Lord. So what we're going to do this morning is we're going to look at um, not necessarily the individual pieces of this of the armor. We're just going to look at why God provided it. So turn back to where we're at. And now look at verse 11 in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. And look what it says. It says in, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11, he says, put on the whole armor of God. Now, what is the armor for? Why would we get saved? What's it going to do? What good is it going to do us uh, to put on the armor of God? Well, look at what that verse says. It says in verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, now this is the very same uh, evil being I was talking of uh, there earlier. Uh, this is the very same evil being that Peter describes. You've heard this uh, said many times, or probably heard it many times. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, he describes the devil this way. He says, let me read that verse, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Now, this can be a warning both to the saved and the lost, in a sense. You know, there's, what I want you to realize this morning is there is an adversary stalking you. Amen. And, and it doesn't matter if you're saved or lost. You know, I, I would think it may be an advantage for Satan to get to someone before they got saved, of course. I think, uh, I think uh, they would be easier to pray without the Holy Spirit living in them. Listen to what Ephesians chapter 2, and you can turn there if you want, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. It talks of the lost person's relationship to Satan. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, and by the way, it describes Satan too. A lot of people who wonder, what exactly entity that is Satan in right now? Because look at what it says. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, it says, And you have the quicken. Now, of course, who, who uh, Paul is talking to is the church of Ephesus. He assumes that everybody in the church of Ephesus are uh, is saved as far as when he's writing the letter, he's writing it to save people. Now, of course, he knows that there's times in churches that there's going to be unsaved people. But in a sense, uh, the church is saved people coming to assemble together. Now, we're supposed to invite unsaved people in our church. We're supposed to have people in our benches uh, that aren't saved. You know, we're supposed to invite people so they can hear the gospel. So we're not always saying that everybody that steps inside the church is saved. But when, when you read the Bible and when you uh, listen to what Paul's writing to, he's talking to saved people at that time. And he says, he says here in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, And you have the quickened, talking to the saved people of the church, and you have the quickened who are dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past, so in other words, before someone gets saved, this is what how Paul describes it. He says, where in time past, ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And so what that's talking about, of course, is, is uh, Paul talking to the church and talking about what we were like before we got saved and how the devil is, is uh, just as it says, the prince of the power of the air and how he... He worketh uh, in the children of uh, disobedience. And so when you read that, you realize that there's an adversary stalking you no matter what. Whether you're saved or unsaved, uh, he's stalking you. And so the saved people, I hope you're not breathing a sigh of relief. In other words, as you sit here and you go, whew, thank goodness I'm, I'm saved because I don't have to worry about the, this uh, uh, prince of the power of the air. 
uh, 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 the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Well, he still stalks us. Amen. You know, you, 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 you're to be a recruiter for God's army, but you're to realize that, man, that, that he's still after us. Just like what Peter said, he's seeking whom he may devour, whether you're saved or not. And, a, and can I say this? An attack is certain. Not if, but when. Satan's looking to devour. Well, what, as a saved person, what would he be looking to devour? Same thing as an unsaved person. First thing it takes. You might know what it takes to get saved. Yes. And how how is it saved? How is it saved? Matter of fact, look right there. If you're still in Ephesians chapter two, look at what it says down there in verse eight. Here's a good description on how to get saved. For by grace are ye saved through faith. faith. Now, so what I'm saying is one of the first things that Satan wants to look to to devour is your faith. He's going to test you on your faith. And that goes uh, uh, for saved people as well as unsaved people. If it takes faith to get saved, hey man, then the first thing he's going to attack is your faith. In other words, what will happen, and I've seen it happen here many times, we'll talk to a, a child. You see we have bus children that we bring in. And uh, they're working with them in the, in the back and, and telling them about Jesus Christ and how Christ came and died for their sins and uh, how they need to confess that they're a sinner uh, by nature and that they are in need of their sin wage to be paid. Christ went to that cross to, to shed their blood to pay their sin wage. And so they're told all these things, preparing them and softening their hearts so that they'll get saved, so that they'll have faith, trying to build their faith and to take that step. And what happens is, and I've seen it time and again, they'll step out of this church and they'll go talk to a friend or a, a loved one. It could be even a parent sometimes. And what will happen is the parent will go, oh, you don't need that stuff. Who do you think's behind that? Amen. Amen. Just like I was 10 years old and I was going to Junior Anna Baptist Church and I told my, my testimony before when I got saved, it was in 1975. And uh, we had moved into a house uh, in Mayville, and uh, fortunately, the landlord of our house, we didn't own it. We were renting it from a, a elderly gentleman and his wife, uh, and uh, he was the assistant to the pastor at Juniata Baptist Church. And we weren't moved into that house very long, and he kind of knocked our door. And I didn't know anything about door knocking or anything like that back when I was 10 years old, but our landlord came and knocked our door. My mom and dad, and I remember when they answered the door, and I was home, and uh, they answered the door, and Mr. Wells stood at our door and said, I I'd like to invite you and your family to church. Well, mom and dad both said, well, we're not much for church going. And uh, he said, well, what about the kids? You know, what about Jimmy? I was standing right there behind him, and uh, I, I kind of wormed my way through and said, I I'd like to go to church. And my dad said, well, he's free to go to church if he wants to. And he said, great, we have a bus ministry, and we'll come pick him up. And so I was the only one that uh, wanted to go to church. And so they come back, they come by and got me. And I don't know how many weeks I went and rode the bus to church. And I heard the gospel. And I, I remember, I, matter of fact, when we went back to that church after I got out of Bible college, years later, I remember the exact pew that I got up out of to go, uh, to go respond to the altar call. And uh, so anyway, um, I went to church. Heard the gospel and what they used to do back then, and I don't remember how exactly it worked. Um, and I can't remember if it was a vacation Bible school or if it was a regular service that I, I think I got saved in a regular Sunday service. And what ended up happening is we were all sitting in the pews, and they would have a general assembly time. And uh, for some reason, they had us all in uh, the, the Sunday morning service, and Pastor Flanders was preaching the gospel. And I got up. They gave me the invitation, and I remember having this compelling feeling to get up and go find out what this was all about. And I, I remember preaching on hell and, and telling, telling us that if you wanted to be safe from going to hell, that you could come to the front and someone would deal with you about salvation. And so I got up, and uh, what happened is, one of the, I think it was the assistant pastor, um, explained salvation to me, how to get saved, and asked me what I wanted to do. And I said, well, I, I want to get saved. And so what he did is he led me to the Lord. 
All that to say, I got back on the bus, went back home, walked into the house and said, Dad, you won't believe it, guess what? He goes, what's that? And I said, I got saved. Now, anybody know what Dad did? He didn't know it. But, no, he, he actually facilitated. He was the fiery dart coming from the devil. Because what Dad did is he chuckled to himself as I told him I got saved. He pulled out his wallet and he goes, Jimmy, this is all the religion we need. That's what he said. And he chuckled, laughed, stuck his wallet back in his pocket, and walked away. Here I am, 10 years old. I'm the only boy. I idolize my dad. And so what happened is my heart just sunk. And, and he didn't even know this, but what happened is that night I got up. And I went in and sat in the, on the side of the tub in the bathroom. And I said, God, whatever I did to make my dad laugh, take it away from me. And so after that, um, we moved not, not, too, not too long after that, we moved from Ava and moved up to Rose City. And of course, there was not a Baptist church in that area that I knew of. Not that I would have went anywhere. I was 10 years old. And, uh, and if there was nobody that was going to come pick me up, I would never dream in my life of get myself to church. And what ended up happening is I never went to church again until I met my wife. Now, I had stepped in churches, went to weddings and that kind of stuff. But as far as growing in the Lord or anything like that, I never went into a church. And so, so what I'm getting at is that's the kind of thing Satan does. Amen. He, he can steal your faith. In that instance with my dad, my, state, my faith was stolen. Now, a lot of people would say, do you think that you lost your salvation then? No. I don't believe I did at all. Now, did I grow in the Lord? Did I grow in my faith? No. I exercised my faith. I got saved. But the devil, through my dad, my faith waned. Amen. So he can steal your faith. And he can do it many different ways. He can, he can steal your health. He can steal your holiness. He can even steal your children and impact them. And so an attack, what I'm saying is, an attack is certain. Another story, Kurt, uh, many of you don't know who Kurt was. Kurt was about my same age. And I warned every boy, uh, because of my personal experience, I led Kurt to the Lord. He was about 10 years old, 11 years old at the time. We sat on that front pew right where Miss Virginia is sitting. And uh, it was after the service was over. Kurt came to the altar and said he wanted to get saved. I said, hang around and let me dismiss the, the church. And I said, I want, I want to talk to you. And so we sat there. And I just wanted to make sure Kurt, what Kurt was, what Kurt wanted. Because I don't want to just pronounce someone saved. So we sat there on the pew and I said, Kurt, do you know? I said, what did you come for? He says, oh, I think I want to get saved. And I said, okay. I took him to the gospel. Simple Romans road. And uh, I said, I showed him the verse. I said, now read that verse. Romans 3.23 said, uh, for all of sin to come short of the glory of God. And I said, Kurt, do you understand it here? Said, yes. I said, okay. Turn to Romans 6.23. Turn the page over. And it was Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death. And I said, Kurt, do you understand what that, that's talking about? And I said, what that's telling you is because you're a sinner, you believe you're a sinner, right? Yes. I said, that's telling you because you're a sinner, you have a sin wage to pay. And I said, it's not just death here on earth. It's not just a physical death. It's talking about the eternal separation from God. And I said, so do you understand that because you're a sinner, you have a sin wage to pay? And if you die without that sin wage being paid, you're going to die separate from God. And I said, now you've been here long enough. I said, what, what does that mean when you die separated from God? He said, it means you go to hell. I said, yep, yeah, exactly. I said, that's what the Bible says. And I said, now, here's the good news. I said, the rest of that verse talks about how Christ paid that sin wage for us. I said, in, in Romans 10, 13, and I said, now, I want you to pay attention to this verse, Kurt. What does that verse say? And he read it. Couldn't read it very well. He said, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's Romans 10, 13. And I said, So what's that telling you to do? 
He said, it's telling me to call on, on the Lord to get saved. I said, yes. I said, now, what you said is you're coming to me wanting to be saved. I said, that's what you need to do right there. I said, you realize you're a, you're a sinner? You realize you have a sin wage to pay? And what you're doing when you call on the Lord to save you, you're asking him to pay your sin wage. I said, now, I want to be clear. Do you want to get saved? He said, yes. I said, okay. So according to the Bible, what you need to do is ask the Lord to save you. You're, you're realizing you're a sinner and that he's the only one out there that can pay your sin wages. You, you can't do it by good works. You can't do it by any of that. I said, so what do you want to do? I want to get saved. I said, okay, so the best of your ability, what you're going to do is ask the Lord to pay your sin wage. He prayed one of the best prayers I've ever heard of a 10 or 11 year old. So he prayed that prayer. And I said, so, Kurt, now. I said, let's look at that Romans 10, 13 again. Look what it says. I said, read that again. I said, he, he read it. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I said, let me ask you a question. What did you just do? He goes, what? I go, what did you just do? I said, read that verse and tell me, did you do what that verse says? He goes, yes. I said, so what does that verse say happens if you do what that verse says? He says, I'm saved. And I go, yep. He goes, so I'm saved. I said, yep. I said, now, here's something that's going to happen, and I guarantee it. I said, here's why I want you to take a pencil. And I said, I want you to mark this verse. And I said, I, I don't know how you feel about folding a page in your Bible, but I said, dog ear that page. What do you mean dog ear? I said, bend that page over so you always know where that verse is. And I said, you know why I'm telling you this? I said, because as soon as you step off that door, somebody's going to question your salvation. I said, you might go home. I said, it might be a friend. But I said, somebody's going to question whether you're saved or not. And they'll say, you know, it might be one of your friends who doesn't believe in the Lord, doesn't believe in what you did, and they're going to laugh at you. And say, how can you, how can you possibly know that you're saved? Or you might have some old man shake his wallet at you and tell you, that this is the only religion you need. Now, my dad was an old man at the time, but you get what I'm saying. And so I said, so do you see what I'm trying to tell you, Kurt? I said, the devil's going to attack you because of your salvation. He always does. And so what he did is he took and marked that verse in his mind. Amen. And he went here for quite a few years afterwards until he ended up moving down with his dad downstate. And he's been back here a few different times. Or he moved back up for a while, came to church here as an adult, and then moved back down the state. You know, he's he's kind of kind of in the in between, settling down right now. But I tell you this, he knows he's saved. Amen. The devil. That's what I I told him. I said, if you'll mark that, and and I said, here's another thing, Kurt. I said, when you have doubts, do you know what the Bible tells you you're supposed to do? Anybody know what the Bible tells you to do if you have doubts? Yeah, turn to the Bible. Romans, our first John chapter 5, verse 13. For these things have I written that ye may know that you're saved. And so when we look at that verse 11 in Ephesians chapter 6, it says, Wherefore remember, or I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You know what? The, the first piece of armor that you need to really have is God's Word. Amen. You can always turn to God's Word. You see. And so, and so an attack, what I'm trying to tell you, is that an attack is certain. And, and the armor also helps us. Because uh, look at verse 13. It says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. And so what, what Paul is encouraging us to do is it, it's to declare a position for us. That when we got saved, that we can stand with God. That he's provided everything that we need to stand against the devil and against the wiles of this world. Because they're all coming through the devil. How do you know that? Go back to Ephesians chapter 2. I mean, the devil wants to impact everybody, and especially those that aren't saved or those who struggle with what they did to get saved. 
It says again, he's the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Amen. You know what? One of the first things that, that Satan will try to do is to get you to turn away from God. Satan loves disobedient children. Amen. Those that will turn away from God. And so, and so put on the armor of God. And the greatest piece of armor we got, of course, we won't go through all the individuals, but the greatest piece we got is his word. It's the first thing that God tells us to turn to. And, and always remember this, the armor helps us to defeat our foe. That, that last verse we'll look at there in verse 16, it says, Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. You know what that means? You know, what the, you know what it means, the greatest? Do you know what your greatest defense is? The Bible. Put your faith in that Bible. It says again, above all, taking the shield of faith. So it's almost kind of like this. I've done this before, where you're putting this up before you. Amen. And using it as a shield of faith. So having faith in God's word. Now, my challenge to you is, if not saved, will you join the ranks? Why not get saved? What a difference it can make. And if you are saved, will you suit up uh, and wear the uniform? In other words, we didn't go through all the, all the particulars and what we suit up with, but the most important thing we can realize is God's word. Amen. So what a challenge. Let's pray. Father, again, we're grateful. And Lord, I pray that you help us this morning. And Lord, again, maybe there's someone here this morning who has not placed their faith and trust in you. But Lord, I...